Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, joined by my co-host, Jason Memel. Hello, Jason. Hello. It's uh, awesome to have you here, and it's awesome to have our very awesome guest, Dr. Justin Sledge. Hello, Dr. Sledge. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me on, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to chatting. Wonderful. You know, the, our show's been running for almost 10 years, and we have said this before, but we'll let you and whoever's listening and watching in on, on a deep esoteric secret, which is we mostly started the show to talk to people that we think are cool and interesting so that they have an excuse to talk to us. <laughs> I, I would say you are the very epitome of this of this project because we love your channel so much. And uh, Jason and I are in a uh, we're in a group chat for an esoteric group that we're in, uh, a G chat. And uh, basically, every time you release a video, it's like, yay do Dr. Sledge and we talk about it and we rush out to listen to it. So that's why uh, we're we're really happy that uh, that, uh, that you're here and uh, we know that everybody who is listening and watching is going to be just as happy or happier. Now, uh, before we can get into what is, is sure to be a fascinating interview with uh, a fascinating scholar and content creator, uh, we do have to do our commercial for our Patreon. Uh, Jason, do you want to time me tonight? Yes, let me get my timer set up. Okay, Stop so okay. Um, we do, this is a necessary part of keeping the show alive, but we don't love giving you a commercial. So what we're going to try to do is do it as fast as possible. I think my record is 36 seconds. At some point, I'm going to reach where, where I can't go any faster, right? There, there, is, there is a physical <laughs> limit on how much information can be conveyed through voice. Uh, but we'll see, we'll see if we can hit that. Okay, Jason, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, tell me when. And three... Two, one, go. We can't present the show without your financial help, so please go to patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can uh, help us out, and if you don't want to do... Uh, uh, you can do one-time donations by going to uh, paypal.com slash Gnostic. That's paypal.com slash Gnostic, patreon.com slash Gnostic. Money's not the only way you can help us. You can also tell people about the show. You can share it on your social media. You can send your favorite episodes to someone that you uh, love. Uh, uh, like and subscribe. Definitely give us good reviews in the podcast form on Apple Podcasts because the R concept is screwing us over there. <sighs> How did I do, Jason? 33 <laughs> seconds. Hey! Love there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Well done. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> new new record. Okay, now uh, uh, now we can get into the good stuff. Uh, Dr. Sledge, um, what first intrigued you about esoterica, and how did you start engaging with it academically? Yeah, I so... I think that it began when I was a uh, when I was a young person. I was really interested in. Uh, I grew up with shows like Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World and Leonard Nimoy on In Search of, and you know these are these are sort of shows from the '70s and '80s that uh, that looked into things like Bigfoot and Atlantis and ghosts and demons and all this. And I just found that stuff fascinating. And I'm not sure that I ever believed in any of it. But I felt like it was worthy of being researched. And so I had this very early interest in, in this kind of uh, esoterica. And uh, in my teenage years, I was like on a BBS, which I mean, BBS is the you know, dinosaurs of the internet. And I found something on Dr. John Dee and angelic language. And this just really blew my mind that, that these 16th century magicians were talking to angels using all kinds of various magical technologies over the course of, of, of many years. And this, it just struck, it struck a core with me. It was fascinating. And whether you believe in this stuff or you don't believe in this stuff or whatever that means, that it needs to be studied seems, seemed really clear to me. And so I always kept a foot in studying it, at least from an academic perspective or an academic angle. And then I also kept a foot in studying other kinds of academic things, religious studies, philosophy. And at some point, as I was wrapping up undergraduate, the question just became, you know, what do I want to specialize in? And the answer became pretty clear that I wanted to specialize at some level in Western esotericism. And so I eventually uh, made the dive and, and, and moved over to Amsterdam for a little while to, to study there at the University of Amsterdam's uh, Hermetic Studies Program. So it really emerges from a deep appreciation that the world is really weird and that the weird parts of the world need to be examined and they need to be examined skeptically, right? So from a, from a critical lens, I just don't want to go around believing in things because Leonard Nimoy says that it's real, 
and sympathetically, which means that you take it seriously on its own terms. So if I read a text by John Dee, my job is not to go into that text and pick it apart to see what, you know, what I believe and don't believe or pick it apart to make fun of it or pick it apart to ridicule it or something like that. My, my task as a scholar is to look at these texts and try to understand them, to understand them on their own terms. And who cares what I think, really? Um, I'm just some guy, I'm just some guy. I'm not talking to angels. Um, so uh, that's really where things got started. And, um, and I still have a longstanding interest in John Dee to this day. It's still a, a thing I, I really find, I continue to find fascinating. Yeah, well, well, definitely a fascinating figure, and has actually um, been on our list to do a proper show about for for a very long time. So, uh, look, look, look for that, uh, uh, fans, in the future for the the revelation of the true double O seven. Um, okay, so so that's that's sort of the background uh, uh, with esoterica, uh, the interest, the the academic study of it. But what inspired you to, to start your YouTube channel? So I started the YouTube channel um, for two reasons. The major region was that I'm underemployed. Uh, academ the academic job market is a, a nightmare. And uh, trying to get a tenure track job anywhere is just really difficult, really, really difficult. And a lot of the stuff that is, in, that is included in getting a tenure track job in the academic job market has to do with publishing a lot of things in obscure journals and, and publishing long monographs that basically no one reads. And, uh, and also we moved to a place so I could support my partner. She got a, a rabbinical posting here in Detroit and moving to a place just greatly limits what you can get a job in. And so after you know a few years of trying to get jobs uh, in philosophy and in religious studies and kind of picking up gigs here and there, just couldn't find anything. I couldn't find anywhere that was willing to support me doing the educational work that I wanted to do. The other side of it was I was consuming a lot of content on YouTube, I was consuming a lot of educational content. So my my partner and I decided, for instance, that we were going to go to Iceland for our honeymoon. And so I did the thing that everyone does, right? I began teaching myself Old Norse so I could read the, the sagas and Old Norse. And I found Dr. Jackson Crawford's uh, YouTube channel who produces amazing content on Old Norse and Viking uh, mythology, Old Norse uh, mythology. And it just began to firm, kind of foment in me what if I were to do something like that, not on Old Norse stuff, because I don't have any expertise there, but in Western esotericism. And so I started kind of Googling around and looking on YouTube for, uh, for content on Western esotericism. And I have to say that the content's really uneven. There's some really good stuff, and a lot of stuff is really, really bad. Um, and I say bad, I just mean badly informed, people kind of shooting from the hip, people pretending that, you know, that they have all the secrets to everything when in fact this field is very, very underdeveloped. And so I talked to my brother who was a big uh, consumer of YouTube content and I asked him, hey, do you think I could make a ch YouTube channel about esotericism? And I floated this idea by a few people and you know, basically I was told, yeah, I think this might work. I think this is a niche in a way, but niche in a way that would drive, that would, you know, people would be interested both skeptics and, and practitioners alike. And uh, in Baruch Hashem, you know, thanks to God, um, it has, it's, it's been pretty successful so far. And I've been really, really, really profoundly shocked by how, how, how it's working out. So yeah, it's, I wanna be an educator. I feel it's my duty to be an educator. If you have knowledge, it's, for me, it's an ethical obligation to share it. And I wanted to be able to share it in a way that would fill in some voids that I saw in the, the content that was out there. And, you know, God willing, um, uh, make some parnasa, make some, make a living doing it. And so uh, that's, that's shaping up as well. So yeah, it's, it's those kinds of factors shaping up into one reason or several different reasons that kind of contributed to why I, I started Esoterica. Also the pandemic, right? I was planning to do Esoterica before the pandemic. And then literally the week that I was planning to drop the first eight videos of the channel, uh, that was when the lockdown happened and I was like, well, I mean, I have time now. So being trapped at home was a, was, a, was, was a boon, not to make light of the tremendous suffering uh, that people have experienced uh, because of COVID-19. Yeah. Well, yeah, though, that's, uh, the, the, that's a fascinating and, and, and wonderful uh, the origin story. And uh, I'm really glad that you are following your you're calling to be an educator in this in, in this uh, way. Uh, and, and as you said, uh, I, I think that you really are 
doing valuable work because uh, we have also noticed that about esoteric content on YouTube. Um, we've noticed that uh, <laughs> uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, and I imagine as well within academia, uh, which is, as you mentioned, no matter what your field, incredibly challenging to, to get into tenure track. But I, I suspect perhaps with a focus on esoterica, uh, that might be, you know, even doubly so. Um, uh, uh, Jason, you you had a question, right? Yeah, yeah. I, well, and I think you've already kind of uh, uh, gone there discussing, I think, what you'd already sort of seen in the, in the esoteric content world. Um, uh, and I think, like, just to even echo it, I think, like, uh, in, I think in, in, the, in even some of the best cases, a lot of the content has still been mostly, like, conversational, not unlike our show here, um, which isn't exactly pedagogical. You know, like, the, you may pick up a, an interesting little tidbit about, about, the, about actual esoteric content, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's alongside the, the, the book launches and the, you know what I mean? Like the promotional tours that, <laughs> that lead people to, to these more conversational podcasts. Um, uh, so I guess, is there anyone in the, in, anyone else in the, in the sort of esoteric content uh, landscape that you'd maybe, um, uh, thinking more positively, say like, oh, this was somebody doing something interesting or even somebody doing interesting educational content out there that you were like, I think like I think I want my show to kind of look like that. Yeah. Um, so again, I, I mentioned Jackson, Cro Jackson, Dr. Jackson Crawford earlier, uh, and of course he stands in front of beautiful mountains and, and talks about Thor and things like this. Oh, then. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I really was inspired by him. Um, I, I also saw that uh, Dr. Angela Puka was also uh, she runs Angela Symposium was doing some uh, uh, content creation that was academic about uh, largely about paganism and shamanism and magic. And I found her content to be really engaging and high quality. And eventually I found other people, um, Let's Talk Religion, uh, Philip Holm is a really fantastic guy. Also, uh, Religion for Breakfast is just a phenomenally good YouTube channel on, uh, on religious studies more generally, focusing a lot on early Christianity, which also includes some, Gnostic some Gnosticism and stuff like that. Uh, Dana Trell, uh, the modern hermeticist, uh, did, uh, was also doing really great academic work on, on esotericism. Um, also, Zevi, my friend Zevi Zavin, uh, who's uh, doing work on uh, mysticism, but, but really focusing a lot in on Kabbalah, uh, who I met after this channel had been developing. So there is a lot of good content out there. There is a lot of good content. I think that where, my, where the content I'm creating has a good niche is that I'm creating what I would consider to be upper level, undergraduate level. So this would be something like uh, someone who's a religious studies major who could, as a junior or a senior in undergrad, this is, that's where I'm pegging, basically pegging the level of my material. It assumes you have some background in religious studies. It assumes you have some background in philosophy, but not much more beyond introductory level classes. And it does the, I, I hope it does. I shouldn't say that it does. I hope it does. It, it tries to do the work of, of presenting these texts and figures and ideas within the historical and academic context. But also, and, and again, I don't, I, I try to be, I truly try to do this well, and I, I don't know that I do or I don't. Um, I try to situate it within the realm of historical or, or historical and modern practice. Mm -hmm. So I try to have a, I try to sort of have my cake and eat it too, where I want to, the channel to be rigorously academic but also trying to locate this stuff inside the world of, of, of practice as well. So yeah, there is a lot of great content out there. Um, the, the problem is that a lot of that great content is also in the mire with really bad content. I think of, um, well, I won't call anyone out, but the, the amount of, of white supremacist, racist, uh, 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 homophobic content that I see and Western esotericism um, with people who have a couple hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube that push conspiracy theories about Atlantis and the Aryan supremacy of the Aryan people. Um, that stuff has hundreds of thousands of followers and, and it's rubbish. And I, I feel like the task that I take upon myself and the task that I see that other people take upon is to get the ideas out there that say, this material does matter and it matters not because it makes so-called Aryan people or, or Jewish people or any people superior, uh, it matters because it's a part of the a part of the human experience and a part of human history, uh, and it's a part of modern 
practice, really deep, people's profound spiritual lives. So for those reasons, among many others, this material is deeply worthy of investigation, academic and otherwise. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, uh, John, do you mind if I keep running with my questions here? Oh, please. Uh, I, I just want to add in a comment that, you know, semi-joking, only semi, that, that we started the channel to to, uh, to talk to cool people. Um, <laughs> but, all, you know, outside of that, there is some truth to that. But obviously that, that is not 100% true. And, and, you know, we notice similar that talk about what Gnosticism is, of course, is it would be a multi-part uh, 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 series. And, of course, maybe there was no such thing as ancient Gnosticism. Not, not, not a view that I hold, but, uh, of course, I respect the scholarship around it. But, I, you know, we started the channel because we saw lots of uh, people calling themselves Gnostics, you know, uh, calling what they do Gnosticism on YouTube and in podcasts, uh, doing exactly what you're talking about, Dr. Sledge, right? Uh, the very, very harmful conspiracy theories, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, racism, uh, really, you know, bizarre, really out there stuff that is that is harmful um, uh, and, and calling it uh, uh, Gnosticism. <laughs> and uh, you know, I uh, it, it's a, a attrition and a, a movement and a body of work that that is very special to me. So you know, we did try to get out there to to combat that. <laughs> so um, uh, so I, I'm glad that we we have similar uh, origin stories and that there are people out there like yourself noticing this and kind of answering the call to to combat it. Uh, so uh, sorry, Jay, uh, Jason, go ahead. What <laughs> I'll, add one, I'll add just one thing to that. And it's also not the case that I think that Western esotericism is in somehow inherently progressive or anything like that. Yeah. It's not like they were, you know, they were inherently woke social justice warriors or whatever, anything. Man. Uh, it, it's, for me, it's worse than all, right? I think there's really amazing things about Agrippa. I think there's really amazing things about ancient Gnosticism. I think there's really amazing things about a lot of things. I think also there was a lot of mystics who were really enthusiastic about the Inquisition and the Crusades. Um, and Bill Hildegard of Bingen being a, a pretty classic example, Bernardo Claveau. These are two mystics who I really think are amazing mystical thinkers who also were the mouthpieces for genocide. And so, again, it's, for me, it's worse than all. And I, I, don't, I don't feel the need to, I don't feel like one diminishes the other. I feel like that the, the responsible thing to do at the historical register, the academic register, is say, you can be both, and most people actually, even now, are probably both. Most, the greatest geniuses now, probably also, when viewed from the point of view of history, I mean, they're not going to—they're not going to come out great in the wash. Like, so uh, it's to, to throw the baby out with the bathwater is a wrong, is an error, right? Uh, Bernardo Clovo supported the the Crusades. Well, let's just not read him. Let's cancel him. That's idiotic. Um, uh, that's just a, all right. and also. Let's, Bernard Clairvaux was a great mystic, so therefore let's ignore that he supported, he was enthusiastically about the Crusades. Well, let's not ignore that either. Yeah. I'm a both and kind of guy. That's just my, because people are complicated and if, and if we reject that people are complicated, what, what are we doing? I don't know. So I, I find that these characters are all, these people, these ideas are always more compelling when we when we try to be really honest about, about them in their totality. And I think I've, I've seen a, a great quote that says that history that leaves out the mess isn't. Yeah. Well, we also understand them better, right? If we if we push away the things that we don't like, and uh, we're not going to get um, a full grasp of what of, of what it is that they're trying to say, who they were, and what their philosophy is, and what they're saying about the world, right? It's not that you have to read every word that they ever read or wrote, but if they're talking about things that are unpleasant and outdated and hold some 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 horrible views, uh, it, it's still going to be illuminating for uh, for their worldview and for understanding uh, these figures. And uh, uh, Jason and I are both part of a modern Gnostic church, the Apostolic Joanite Church, who, who sponsors this podcast. And we, you know, we do have to grapple with stuff like that. You know, Hildegard um, uh, is a great example. Actually, so is Bernard, uh, because both of them are saints on, on our on our calendars. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Hildegard did, the, did this amazing mystic, but but I believe was also 
you know, calling the, the calling for the the eradication or calling for the uh, the kafirs to be to be treated rather harshly, <laughs> right? So oh, here yeah. we are, a modern Gnostic church who uh, uh, who also draws on the on the Christian mystical tradition, but at the same time, you know, we have this saint who a lot of us love uh, and study quite closely, but at the same time is is calling you know, for for the eradication of one of the Gnostic movements at the time. So uh, well, yes. Nice. Um, so go ahead, Jason. <laughs> yeah, like, well, I mean, j just to, to really even engage with the fact that here in Canada, we are currently grappling with um, with some exposed history that wasn't always really that well disclosed about yeah. how, how about the That's indigenous right. communities throughout, throughout all of yeah. uh, Canada. And and that, like, in many ways, people are experiencing that same challenge. How can I, how can I uh, have the same pride I did for my nation when uh, when now I'm I'm being forced to to observe this history? And I think I think the both and statement is is brave and powerful, and I think it's it's incredibly valuable. So I just wanted to to underline how important that is to be able to look at both. Um, and also, this is true about my tradition as well, uh, the Jewish tradition. The Talmud has all kinds of horrifying anti anti um, anti non anti not Jewish people. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's terrible. It's it's repulsive. The Zohar, the Zohar also. Uh, one of the greatest mystical texts, I think, in world history, um, also just is horrifyingly, um, uh, I mean, racist is not the right word, but bigoted, whatever, whatever word you want to use, racist, bigoted, whatever. And people, you know, people will accuse me and you know, they say, well, how can you, you know, how can you believe in the Zohar if it says these things? I'm like, I'm a reconstructionist Jew. Uh, my 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 philosophical view, my religious view, is that tradition gets a vote, not a veto. The tradition is not something that we inherit and we just have to do. We we have to give the tradition a vote. We have to give the tradition a voice. But I don't have to do what all the voices say. That's insanity. And so, uh, I think that's true of any religion. You know, you look at any religious text. There's going to be dreadful things in some parts of it. So yeah, I don't feel beholden to that. And so when I, again, when I approach this stuff, sometimes I've gotten angry emails from uh, cult practitioners. I did an episode on the Abramelin ritual and got some really angry um, practitioners writing me saying that I was making fun of the ritual because I mentioned the part at the end about the dancing monkeys and stuff. And I'm like, I didn't write the thing, man. <laughs> yes. Like I, I didn't write it. And if it's anyone can read this, so I'm not making fun of it. I, I do try to treat the material seriously, but also with a light hand, right? I try to be, this stuff is kind of weird and funny, so let it be weird and funny. It's like, I, I think that, I think you can take the, I think one can take a tradition seriously without taking it literally, I guess. Yeah. And, um, but they were really angry about the monkeys. And I'm like, I didn't write the monkey part, but you think I was gonna like make a YouTube episode and leave out the dancing monkeys, summoning magical dancing spirit monkeys? Are you crazy? That's gold. Um, so, but they were really angry. And and again, I, do I think that uh, the Abramelin ritual or whatever is a powerful has been a, has proven to be a powerful ritual technique for people to achieve uh, deep spiritual awareness? Absolutely. But it also got dancing monkeys in it. Yes, exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, we spend a, a lot of time, you know, again, in these in these private chats, uh, Jason and I talking about um, some of the, the funny stuff that's in our traditions and, and, and appreciating some of the weirdness of it. And, and knowing that just because we can joke around and sometimes we're accused of making a joke out of everything, right, which which we don't want to do. But at the same time, like this, this is being true to the tradition. Yeah, uh, in a way, um, which which I, I think uh, you know what I, what I'm getting at. It, it's an appreciation of the tradition as well. The fact that that we can find humor about it, that we can joke about it, and the fact that it's it's weird in a modern context, but sometimes, oftentimes, it's it's weird in their their, their context, right? <laughs> the, the high strangeness. No, right. I, I see sometimes these bumper stickers that have like Bible verses on them, right? Like First John three, you know, John three sixteen. Yeah. And I've always wanted to get one made. Uh, I think it's in Second Peter or First Peter, where uh, Paul's at the end of his letter and he at the end of the letter he says, and so and so like and keep that coat for me that I left there. And also don't trust uh, Alexamios, the the coppersmith. He's he's a liar. And you're like, oh, this is a letter from a guy. Yeah. Like this is actually a letter. Like I for, I, I, for, I forgot my coat. And I sometimes want to put on a bumper sticker that verse. So when people look it up, it's the most mundane thing one can imagine. But at the same time, it's profound. 
And so again, like um, yeah, when we take ourselves too seriously, I don't think anyone else is going to take us terribly seriously. So you're you're kind of giving me this this like fun idea, and it's something like we're we're going to be exploring in, in, on this channel uh, a little later on as well. But this fun idea of intentionally like interpreting something mundane and trying to see how holy you can make it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like to find as many interpretations for it. Like what if what if there was really some deep esoteric meaning to the I forgot my yeah. coach like where could we go with that and just free associate like you know yeah. at this point we've left scholarship behind <laughs> um, yeah and, and, uh, and you know you know the, the you know the, the jewish mystical tradition it makes a science of that it says that the, the <laughs> most absurd laws in the bible are the most important so um you know the laws around uh, not eating making sure not to eat, consume one part of one nerve which seems like a tiny little thing they make to be of cosmic significance so that, the, that, that um, because the wisdom of human beings is nothing compared to the wisdom of God. And when God, when, when human beings think that something is a minor thing, God's hidden the most meaningful thing in there. So Judaism has, yeah, at least mystical Judaism, Kabbalah has made a, a science out of it is a strong word, but it, made, <laughs> it, it certainly made life inconvenient with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a pr approach with the rigor of science. Um, yeah. uh, it, it really is a joy. And, you know, I encourage people out there because, you know, some, as you said, some of the um, uh, perhaps the laws uh, the, 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 that are uh, hard to understand or innocuous are, are given quite the treatment through, through Kabbalah. But, you know, this, some of the most mundane and innocuous passages in, 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 in Bible are, are really uh, given... Um, meaning and interpretations uh that i think would, would blow most people's minds so i heartily encourage people i should find some examples <laughs> i guess the, i'm just repeating kings, what you're saying Edge, I mean, but... the, the classic example is the kings of edom in genesis there's a list of kings of edom that died it's just, it's just a random list of kings that died from from the edomites and you know it's it's a if you read it, it's a throwaway passage and the following kings died right and you would think okay it's just a list of king edomite kings but oh no according to zohar those were all the structures of evil that existed prior to the creation of the world. And those structures are actually responsible for the, 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 the primordial forces of evil and the Sitra Achra, the other side. And they, the Zohar just goes on and on and on about these kings of Edom. And you're like, really? That's a, that, that, those, that one verse is, is the origin of all the evil in the universe? They're like, yeah, it's there. <laughs> it's the kings of Edom. So, you know, like, uh, before, well, sorry, before we move on, I, I just mm -hmm. do have to put a pin in, in something that uh, Dr. Sledge uh, said earlier, Jason, uh, which was uh, tradition is, is a vote, not a veto. Because again, yes. both on the show and in private, uh, uh, we have a lot of discussion, both, uh, both of us and, and among our, our friends and co-religionists about, about tradition and traditions and making them work in a modern world and, and what have you. So I'm going to steal that, Dr. Sledge. I, I don't know if you came up with it, but it's brilliant. I did um, no, I should, I should be really clear. It comes from Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, who is the the spiritual founder of the form of Judaism that I that I subscribe to, uh, Reconstructionist Judaism, and he he says this that that tradition ha uh, he says that tradition must have a vote, not a veto, which is which is a double edged sword because that means that tradition is weak compared to orthodoxy. Yeah. But in order to give it a vote, you have to do all the heavy lifting to make sure, right? Intellectual heavy lifting to make sure that that voice is there. So you got to do a lot of study to give it that vote. And so you don't have the luxury of simply following it blindly, like maybe people in the Haredi world do, but you have to do all the hard work of, in, of, of, of you giving that voice, which means you have to read texts that you find distasteful, difficult, obscure, backwards, reactionary, and you have to read them so sympathetically, right, that their voice can get into the conversation. You can't just throw that out and say, oh, that's just, that's just what people thought in the sixth century. So it's, I, uh, it's, it's neither blind obedience to tradition, nor is it just throwing tradition out. It's, it's, it's the worst possible situation because you have to do both. <laughs> I think uh, I can think of at least one listener specifically who's going to really uh, enjoy the way you articulated that. So I thank you for that. Yeah. Um, uh, but also, since we've talked, we've been talking about like ancient traditions, uh, but also its application to modern people. And I, I do want to kind of uh, make sure that we uh, we bring a Gnostic connection in here. We've kind of skirted around it a bit. But um, so yeah, I think like uh, uh, in 
as you've have you, as you've encountered it through, I think because I think it probably permeates in a lot of areas. Um, uh, what do you think are some of the major misconceptions about Gnosticism? And then, like, is there anything in ancient Gnosticism or in any current iterations that you've seen that you find is uh, intriguing or helpful for people today? So I think I think that when I think about and this this may this may rub up against John a little bit is that one of the misconceptions I think I have about that people have about Gnosticism is that there was the there was Gnosticism, right? Capital gamma, you know, that there was this thing called Gnosticism and you could be you could be one in the ancient world. It's a polemical term, right? It's a term invented by by people like Irenaeus and Hippolytus basically to to slander a group of people. I think that if you were in Rome in the second century and you just happened to walk into a church and and they followed what we now call Valentinianism, and if you met a Valentinian or if you were to meet Valentinus and and ask him what's your belief system called, he would tell you he's a Christian. Full stop. Full stop. And so I think that one of the misconceptions that I think people have about Gnosticism is that you can divorce it in its historical context from Christianity. And I'll say one exception to that. I think the big exception of that is that there are texts in the Nag Hammadi library that are non-Hermetic, non-Christian, texts that represent some kind of spirituality that we don't have any reference point for at all. They're anomalous Gnostic texts. Um, so I think a, a, a criticism that I think that people often bring to bear is that at least in the historical setting, one can separate Christianity from, from Gnosticism. Because if I were to talk to, again, Valentinus or the, the Sethians, I don't think they would call themselves Sethians. They would just call themselves Christians and get on with it. Um, because again, I think that the ortho the Orthodox Christian world likes to paint itself much like the way the Jewish world likes to paint itself. That Moses wore a, a you know a, a, Moses wore a yarmulke and a black suit when he went up on Mount Sinai and spoke Yiddish. That's crazy, but they kind of believe things like that. Well, the ancient Gnostics, I think, were pretty similar. They believed in a what now appears to us to be a very strange form of Christianity, but what's What's the case about the ancient Christian world is that what Christianity meant was up for debate. All they had were some gospels that kind of agree with each other, and they have the writings of Paul, and they have the apocalypse of John. And what they have to do is sort of sort this out, right? How does, what does all this mean? And so the mechanics, what's under the hood of Christianity was precisely what was at debate in the, in the second, third, fourth, even the fifth centuries at some level. And because one group won, because the Orthodox, so, you know, when I say Orthodox, I'm always putting square quotes on Orthodox, because that camp won out, we now think that that was the, the normal version of Christianity. No, there were, there were a dozen Christianities running around. So I think that part of, and now I don't want to go the other path too and say there's nothing true about the fact that there were Gnostics. Clearly there was, there was a group of Christians that were similar enough that they could be grouped together to be combated by Irenaeus and Hippolytus, and also they could be gathered together in texts like the Nag Hammadi Library. I mean, whoever gathered those texts together grouped them because they felt them the, all those codices to be thematically similar enough to, to get them together. And ditto Hippolytus and Irenaeus also thought that they were similar enough that he could, you know, sort of write his books about them. So yeah, I think that that's the main thing. And I think this is true also of medieval esotericism and uh, someone like John Dee, to go back to John Dee, um, that John Dee was an intense Christian. So yeah. was Cornelius Agrippa. They were intensely pious Christians. And I think that many people who go to esotericism, go to, the, go to occultism or go to Gnosticism, they're doing that because they've been profoundly traumatized at some level by mainstream Christianity, uh, whether it's Catholicism or evangelical Christianity, and they don't want to have to come to terms with how Christian it is. And so you, you can't kind of, you can't, you can't separate them. So when I look at someone like Valentinus or I look at, you know, uh, Marcion even, I, I look at someone who's just trying to be a Christian and they're doing the same thing that everybody else was doing in the second century. They're trying to figure out what that means. And whether it's aeons and archons, or whether it's uh, a triune god, you know, 
you know, and, and homoousios and all this stuff, they're sorting out what that means. And so I think the big misconception I see about Gnosticism is that at least from the historical point of view, you can divorce it from, from, from Christianity. Uh, now, from the modern point of view, people who are reconstructing a Gnostic practice in the, in the modern world, well, they can do whatever they damn well please. Uh, that's their prerogative, and no one can tell anyone that they're doing their religion wrong. I don't even know what that means. Um, as to the other question, what people can take away from modern Gnosticism now is, I think this is true of esotericism in general, but I think it's especially true of Gnosticism, is that the world is hostile. This is the thing that I think a lot of people also misconceive about Gnosticism. It, it, it basically inherits a platonic worldview. It views the world as bad. Like this world is basically bad. Now, in some versions, it's worse than others, but the body is bad. It's an impediment. The physical reality is an impediment. It's a cage. It's a, it's a, it's a coffin of the living or whatever. It's a, Marcus Aurelius said that, uh, that, the, that you're, a, 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 you're a corpse carrying around a soul or something like that. Not that Marcus Aurelius was a, was a, was a, uh, a Gnostic, he's a Stoic, but even shows you they were materialist and they still believe things like that. I think that there's a Pollyannish view of reality. I think people have a pretty Pollyannish view of reality that's still very anthro, anthro, anthrocentric. And when I look at reality, when I learn more about space and when I learn more about quantum mechanics or when I learn more about uh, how the universe works, not that I'm an expert in any of those things, I, I see a pretty hostile world. I see a world that's basically a, mostly a giant vacuum full of radiation that had it, were it not for very precarious kinds of circumstances would be completely lethal to us in seconds, nanoseconds. And I often think, in my personal philosophy, which I'm a bit of a metaphysical uh, pessimist, that the Gnostics were half right. That is to say, their diagnosis of existence is true. The world is a dangerous prison. Where I think that they're wrong is that there's no escaping it. Uh, <laughs> there's just death, and you you get turned in. You actually get turned into the various thing that becomes toxic to the people around you, uh, which I find to be a little bit poetic. Uh, I, I appreciate the poetic irony of that. Um, yeah. But I, I, when I find, when I look at Gnosticism, um, when I look at Gnosticism, the world is not, the way that whatever the world is, is not apparent. It's not clear. The world's weird and scary and disorientating. And when I think that, when I imagine a Gnostic in the second century walking through Alexandria, I think that they, they cultivated the sense of being an alien in their own world. They cultivated the sense of, I don't belong here. And we already see that, by the way, in early Christianity, even the writings of Paul, right? I'm, I'm, of, I'm in this world, but I'm of this world. That's already there in Paul. Yeah. And so I think that, the, that they cultivated an, an alienation, a certain kind of alienation. And I think that cultivating that kind of alienation, that this world isn't forever, that the way the world is now is not the way that's always going to be. It's always been that way. And that conforming to the world and conforming to the way this world is, might not be advantageous for you psychologically, spiritually, um, and many registers, most registers perhaps. And if that's true of ancient Alexandria, uh, how much more does that have to be true now where we live in a world that's, you know, late capitalism where uh, if we're lucky, we, we get a crap job that pays half of what it paid 50 years ago to basically throw ourselves into a mountain of debt. Um, and, you know, do we really want to subscribe to that world? I, I don't think it's a world worth subscribing to. And so cultivating one's, not alienation in the negative sense, but cultivating the idea that this world as it is, is not good and doesn't have to be this way. I think that's a pretty, I think that's a pretty progressive way of looking at reality because it means that you don't think that the things that are around you are natural and they've always been that way because they haven't. So I, I, I like the idea that the world, that the world is a hostile place and because it is in many, many ways, um, the universe, especially, I'm not sure about this planet, but we're, we're making this planet increasingly hostile to us because of our short sightedness and stupidity. We're good at that. Um, and, and cultivating the idea, right? I, I think I, this, there's a scene, maybe the most Gnostic ship, you know, movie ever made in some ways is the matrix, which I have lots of problems with the second and third ones. But the end of the first one is that great sequence, right? Where he's, he walks out of the telephone booth, right? And he can see, the matrix in front of him, right? The green code coming down. 
Um, and you realize he's now a foreigner in home. He's a foreigner at home. And to cultivate that sense of being a foreigner at home, I think is, is at some level consciousness building, awareness building. It, it allows you to see things that maybe other people don't see. I think Spinoza was a great example of a person who was a foreigner at home who saw the world in a completely revolutionary way because he was exiled from everything. He lived, he was, you know, when Plotinus talks about the flight of the alone to the alone, that was Spinoza. He was alone, right? Flying to the alone in many ways. And so I think that those who see strangest often see farthest and those that see farthest often see best. Yeah. I love that. That was great. Um, now, I, I of, of the uh, two Gnostics here, I'm probably the least world hating. Um, uh, <laughs> in this, or the least uh, world, at uh, least dualist, because one of the things, like, so I really loved a lot of what you articulated there. But one of the other things that I've often found too is that, like, so it, like Neo can see the code, but then he can also affect the code, and he can actually start to to try to try in some way to uh, assist or help those around him as well. Because I think what I often get get worried about with with some of that philosophy is that it can also turn isolationist, mm -hmm. like. I'm going to sit in my house, you know, and this is the, either the thing either you become a hermit or you become a um, a libertine, um, and that like neither of those are sustainable, <laughs> you right, know. Right, so, right. like, how to be a gnostic when you're driving in traffic and somebody cuts you off? Like, um, how they're do you archon. like? Pardon me. <laughs> they're, 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 an they're an archon. They're an archon. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but or like or. Well, or rather that like, if I understand, maybe if I understand that that person might be having a particularly difficult day or they're cutting me off because they're trying to get home to a, to a family, you know, like that maybe there's an urgent, like the, the, there might be an emergency I'm not aware of instead of just them mm -hmm. not thinking of me, you know? Um, and I guess kind of, I, I guess what I'm sort of rambling my way to a, to a point here is that I, what I, I loved it, like that idea of the alien outside. And then I think what I, all I, the only thing I feel like adding to that is that the alien then outside can then, by the virtue of that different perspective, then then uh, uh, push a little back inside. No, uh, I think like back back to that greater community. I think that's true. Yeah, I think that. Again, yeah, I think that when you when you when you try to see things in that, again, I, the word alienation I think has a really negative context, mostly because of its inheritance from Marxism. But I think there's another kind of alienation where you're you're consciously cultivating a perspective where what's where what's the right way of putting this the way that hegemony works any form of hegemony is by making itself appear natural it doesn't matter what form of hegemony that is it makes itself appear natural right when you listen to the news at night and they describe the weather right it's going to rain tomorrow and the barometric pressure is going to fall and today stocks fell and now you don't have a 401k anymore you can see how stocks fell and now you don't have an you know you don't have a 401k or whatever there it's as if both those two things are the same one of those we don't control one of those is an institution built by human beings but hegemony operates by making them both appear natural the stock market appears like it's a natural thing or the you know the president or whatever whatever thing you want to do and so i think that cultivating that sense of uh, cultivating the sense of being an outsider an alien in the world um allows you to see what's natural, what, what actually is natural and what isn't. And secondly, I think also your point about that this can lead to a kind of uh, isolationist perspective. It can lead you to a, an extremely lonely way of, of, of being in the world. Or you think about the existentialist, right? Sort of, you know, swallowing, you know, big gulps of espresso and smoking cigarettes, right? Uh, because they're alienated and everything is, you know, freakish and weird and they're experiencing existential anxiety, whatever, of uh, the Sartrean nightmare of, uh, of, you know, nausea, of no exit. Yeah, that's that's one outcome. But I think the antidote to that, uh, or antidote to that, the historical antidote to that is Gnostic for, Gnostics were people in a community. They weren't isolated people. I don't think there's any evidence at all of Gnostic monasticism. I just don't know of any examples of that that existed. Now, we do know we, it seems likely that Nagamati Library was preserved by some Christian monastics that preserved those texts and and and. and buried them probably to protect them. But every time we ever see accounts of Gnostics, they're churches, they're ecclesia, they're communities. And so the, I, I think the idea of the, of the isolated Gnostic is, is, is a, it, to me, I don't see any evidence of it historically, right? 
uh, whether it's the, the, the Gnostics of classical antiquity or, or the Cathars, that's why the Cathars were targeted. It's because they were a big community and the church felt threatened by them. Now there's debates about to what degree that's true, but at least in the imagination of the Inquisition, that was, was true. So um, the isolated Gnostic is a weird, historically would be, you know, that would be, I think, a historically strange thing. These were big communities of people. I mean, the Church of Valentinus had, it must have had, well, it must have had at least enough people to have two massively different branches, an Eastern and Western branch, and those branches survive for hundreds of years. You just don't get enough mimetic uh, impetus for your religion to survive for hundreds of years without there being a, a pretty substantial large communities of people transmitting tradition over the course of hundreds of years. So yeah, I think that maybe the Gnostics were aware of this and they formed communities of people where they could say, yeah, the world is really bad. Physical reality is really bad and we got to build a life raft. And that life raft is the ecclesia, it's the church. And we're in this boat together, right? And we will eventually transcend this reality and, re and return to the one or um, to the logos or whatever. So. I, uh, I think that's that's fascinating because I think so, going back to much earlier in our conversation, a lot of the Gnosticism that we that uh, John and I tend to like not respond very well to is is I think a modern Gnosticism that is defining itself essentially as individuals. You mm -hmm. are all little individual Gnostics, um, uh, and I I as your Gnostic teacher will give you some Gnostic wisdom kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, whereas and again I'm just gonna, I'm just gushing at this point. Part of why I I, drew, I became drawn to the uh, Apostolic Joanite Church was because it was a community. I think I'm, I'm just fascinated by how, how much what you've described is exactly what is, I think, so positive about, uh, about at least that expression of it here. John, I keep overrunning you, so I'll let you go now. Oh, no, no, not at all. Yeah, th this, is, this is what the show is. <laughs> so, <laughs> go on tears, my friend, go on tears. But I actually will, uh, of course, I'd love to stay with Gnosticism, but I would like to reorient the, the conversation a little bit to come back to academia because I'm so curious. You know, I've, I, I have an undergrad in religious studies, but that was uh, in the early 2000s, so I've been out of school for a long time. And even then, I had a strong interest in Gnosticism and it would always try to shoehorn it in <laughs> at any opportunity I had. But uh, my impression is, you know, for those outside of academia, right, you hear about these topics and specializations and they sound very niche, you know, Britney Spears studies, what have you. But <laughs> esoterica is especially niche. It's, so I guess my first question is, is it not really a popular topic in academia? And is it actually something that scholars are a little bit wary of, or at least were until recently? I mean, that's just the impression I have. It might be completely, completely off pace. So, if you could tell me a little bit about that, Doctor Sledge. So, no, you're not, you're not off base. Religious studies, religious studies in general, is a very small part of, of the academic world. Uh, I'll give just an example here, and it will maybe be in a bit anecdotal, but I hope it's not anecdotal in a way that's that's uh, totally off the mark. I live in, in Southeast Michigan in Detroit and uh, near Detroit is Dearborn and Dearborn has one of the largest uh, Arab American communities in the, in the outside the Arabic world. I think it's the largest. So Southeast Michigan is a weirdly diverse place with various kinds of Muslims, various kinds of Christians, including Christians from the Arab world. Uh, it has a huge Jewish population. We have the, I think the largest reformed temple in the world, right? So Southeast Michigan's incredibly religiously diverse. And yet the major university here in Detroit does not have a religious studies department. Wow. Doesn't even have, like, won't even hire me to teach religious studies classes consistently. Now, I know that universities have budget problems and there's all kinds of reasons why. But this country, I'll speak for our, for America. I, I don't know what's true for other countries. I, I imagine it is. This country is increasingly polarizing and balkanizing. And on one, one, one of those axes in which it's polarizing and balkanizing is religion. And every Islamophobic person that I've met, every anti-Semitic person I've met, any, every anti-Catholic person I've met, when I've asked them, what is it that you don't like about Islam? What is it that you don't like about Catholics? What is it that you don't like about Judaism? They don't know the first damn thing about these religions and they've never met one. They don't, they, they, 
right? The quickest way to cure an anti-Semite is basically make them hang out with Jews for a week, right? Or, or any kind of, you know, I take an Islamophobic person and get, you know, take them out and, you know, they introduce themselves and they get to meet some people in Dearborn, or whatever. So it's not just a, an, it's not a Western as a terrorism problem. It's the fact that we just don't take the study of religion seriously, despite the fact that it's basically the most powerful social human force in existence, which is insane. That we're not learning about religious studies in high school, that you're not getting basic religious studies classes in high school blows my mind. What does Judaism believe? What does Christianity believe? What are Shintos, um, you know, et cetera. So yes, as it's Western esotericism is niche because that's just the way the academic world is. You specialize and you study whatever, whether that's chemistry where you're studying one, you know, the interactions between some point, you know, some things or not, or it's religious studies where you're studying the sub niche that is Western esotericism. So it is niche. It's, there's no doubt about that. That's just how academia works. The problem is it's a niche in a niche. And it's a niche within a niche that shouldn't be a niche. Religious studies should be part and parcel of every single person's education in the world. And what's also ridiculous is I've just basically never met a person who's like, yeah, I don't want to learn more about the history of magic or alchemy or Gnosticism or necromancy. Every Harry Potter is one of the largest, most popular series in recent memory. Every, like, there's an entire generation that that kind of swims in that world. People are really interested in this, even if it is just interested in it from the level of, uh, you know, kind of academic interest. They don't want to, they don't believe in astrology or they don't believe in alchemy. Or they don't believe in magic. But I've just not met the person who says, yeah, I'd, I'd like to learn less about these topics. They're like, yeah, this is interesting. It's weird. Like, who doesn't want to learn about demons and stuff? It's crazy. Um, and so it's, it's doubly stupid. Is that the right word? Stupid. It's doubly stupid. Let's call it stupid. It's stupid because we need to have a much higher level of religious, uh, religious studies, education, academic study of religion level in the United States. But I think that's probably true of Canada and everywhere else. And two, this top, these kinds of topics are incredibly interesting to people. I think people are very interested in these topics. That doesn't mean they're committed to the idea of becoming a ceremonial magician. But like, if you ask people like, why did the witch hunts happen? They're like, oh yeah, that's crazy. I want to learn more about that. I think, and this is where I think it's the second part of how I think it's stupid, is that universities would benefit from having, and again, I'm sell, I, I, I sound like I'm selling myself, but maybe, maybe I am. Uh, they would benefit from having classes like this. If you could take a, if you go to university and take a class on the witch hunts or the history of magic or the history of alchemy, I'm pretty sure those classes would fill up. I think they would fill up. I think people would be interested in them. And one of the things that universities have a problem with is trying to get people to fill them, get people in classes, get people attracted to coming to college. So yeah, it's a niche and it's a niche within a niche, but it, it's a symptom of a much bigger problem. And the bigger problem is we're not investing in the United States at least, and I'm sure this is true of other countries, but I want to speak for other countries. We're not investing in religious education and to our detriment because uh, religious bigotry just can't breathe the air of education. Bigotry in general can't breathe the air of education. And so it's really difficult to believe that Muslims hate everybody. If you learn about Islam and are sitting in a classroom with Muslims being like, yeah, we don't believe stuff like that. And to know Christians, right? That people think, oh, Christianity is just this tyrannical religion that blah, 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 blah converted people by the sword. It's only the Inquisition. It's only the Crusades. No, that's not true either. That's a silly straw man version of Christianity. So yeah, it's niche, but the, the, the niche has to do, the niche has a lot to do with, with, uh, with the, the fact that religious studies has also been made into a niche and I think unjustifiably. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree. And you know, that that's, that's been my experience, uh, both both of connections uh, uh, to academia and just what I've noticed, um, and it, it blows my mind. And you're right when you're talking. I know you're specifically talking about the U.S. context, but I can definitely say that's the Canadian context, and it it blows my mind. That you know, it blew my mind back in 2001 that that there that the high, that there isn't a high school course on on world religions academically uh, taught, um, and, and how much that 
good just that one simple course would do. Um, and yeah, you're right as, as well that, you know, when you're just talking with, when you're selling yourself, uh, any, any university administrators out there watching, but, but I know, um, there's a local university here, the religious studies department has a, uh, a course on, on witchcraft, on witches, the history of witchcraft, the history of witches. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's booked up every semester, right? <laughs> it's definitely the number one course that people take in that, uh, 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 in the religious, uh, uh faculty. So, um, okay. Jason, uh, did have to split a little bit or, uh, earlier, but if we can keep going, uh, Dr. Sledge for, for a little bit longer, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, fantastic. So, so I have a, a couple more questions. Um, so, we kind of talked about the value of looking at, at this as, as a academic discipline, but is there something in esoterica that the people of faith in mainline religions can can learn about the human condition through? Um, is there anything for atheists uh, to, that they may get a, a value philosophically through engaging with, with some of these esoteric religions? Yeah, I think that to answer the first question, I think that or that's called orthodox believers. I, I don't like that term because I don't think anyone's ever really orthodox. I think if you ask an average Catholic whether they think that a, um, w women should have the right to abortion or if they really believe that a talking snake tricked a woman in a garden, they're going to be like, eh, right? So I think that the, the orthodoxy is always a weird, a weird, uh, it's, a, it's a regulative ideal, I think that uh, Immanuel Kant would say. Um, I think that what's interesting about esotericism and the esoteric aspect of a person's religious belief is that many people often think that their religions are um, are boring, frankly, right? They think their religions are boring. And it's true that in many ways, the version of the religion that gets sold to many people, that gets presented to many people, is just follow a bunch of rules or you'll go to hell, you know, or whatever equivalent of the bad afterlife, you'll get reincarnated as a donkey or something. And so, it's somehow like a th you basically you do your religion because you're being threatened by some dude at the front of the room on Sundays or Saturdays or whatever day, Fridays. And also you're taught the most boilerplate version of your religion. It's the most sort of humdrum version. The esoteric dimension of these religions, which by the way, was almost always cultivated by people who were deeply dedicated to the orthodox version of the religion. Again, we go back to Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard never wanted to do anything other than be an extremely pious Catholic woman. Um, you look at many other of these people through history, they don't want to undermine their religion. They want to deepen their religion. They want to get into the really core of the religion, the hidden part of the religion that's really important. And so I think that by studying the esoteric aspects of these of your religion and, uh, and of other religions, but specifically the religion you belong to, it really, un it really opens up right the religion it, you, you you find a power up and that 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 secret power up that you find shows you that your religion is actually really complicated really beautiful and really weird right it is not the humdrum catholicism that you were taught it's not the humdrum judaism you got at sunday school your religion's out of control weird god masturbated reality into existence like that stuff like that right yeah. so i think that for for believers that's a reason to turn to that material and so I've consulted with people who, for instance, want to consult with Judaism because they, they know that I subscribe to a Judaism that's very much interested in Kabbalah, not that I would describe myself as a, as a Kabbalist, but they want to convert to Judaism because they think Judaism has all this stuff to offer with Kabbalah. And I've talked, many of these people are Catholic. And I'm like, do you, do you, you read Meister Eckhart? Like I would trade, what, you know, like the thing they do is like sports, right? Athletics, like you, know, you trade players for other players to get stuff. Like, I don't know, man, I've traded some Kabbalah to get Meister Eckhart, let me tell you. Um, and if you haven't read Meister Eckhart and seen him as a, a part of your tradition, um, then I think you're short selling your tradition, you know? So it, I, don't convert to this tradition because you think there's something here that's not there. There's stuff that y'all have that we don't. And I'm, I'm, I'm deeply in awe of someone like Meister Eckhart. I mean, I've literally copied by hand an entire sermon of Meister Eckhart in calligraphy because I find it so illuminating and I'm not Catholic. Um, and is there a thing for atheists? Absolutely. Like, I don't think I believe in God. I don't think I'm committed to belief in the supernatural at all. I don't believe in the supernatural, but what I do believe in is awe. I do believe in awe. And 
if even if you want to go down the route of straightforward psychology, just atheist materialist psychology, one of the things that we know is a that is a great indicator, a great predictor for mental health is awe. Having the experience of awe as much as possible. Awe is an incredibly overwhelming, very, very important experience. Uh, Feldman has done some extensive studies on this. And the esoteric is almost always about awe. It's always, almost always about how you're a part of a much vaster scheme of things. And you get a glimpse of it every once in a while. And I think cultivating the esoteric angle, reading these esoteric texts and taking them seriously is that it reminds you that the world's more complicated. The world's more weird. It's more hidden. It's more dangerous. It's more alluring. It's more, um, I don't know, shocking. And that if you, and if you read that literature and take it seriously, like, wow, this is like really, really weird and bizarre and fascinating. I think that that opens you up to the possibility of the experience of, of awe. Because when I read a text like, I don't know, um, the gospel of truth, right? The gospel of truth. I'll just pick one out of a hat. The hat of esotericism. Uh, what kind of hat that would be? Um, wouldn't be this one. There's not enough room in this hat. Not enough room. Um, yeah, well, it'd have to be a, a tall magician style top hat, right? So, yeah, it had to, yeah, yeah, to be yeah. right. It has to be yeah. like a pretty, or a mitre, like a bishop's mitre, yeah. something, something deep. Yeah. Um, a dunce hat, maybe. <laughs> um, that when I read the Gospel of Truth, I, I don't describe, I don't, I don't think of myself as an agnostic or a Christian, but that text is awe-inspiring. It's so beautiful. When I read the, when I read the, uh, oh, even better, the, the Thunder Perfect Mind. Yeah. My God. Thunder Perfect Mind, just reading it out loud, feels like I've just done athletic meditation. When I really try to embody and feel in my body, see in my mind, experience in my existence, these hugely vacillating contradictions. It, it's a, it's it's spiritual athleticism, and I I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the supernatural, but I believe in awe. I believe in in I believe in feeling the ocean of being wash over me, and experiencing it in its complexity. And I don't know of a text that does that. It does that more for me than something like Thunder Perfect Mind. So, no, if you want to be an atheist and just say, like, this is all nonsense and stupid, well, that might say more about you than it does about these texts, right? So, ditto with, like, you know, I, I get the same feeling when I read Rimbaud. And if, if there is a modern atheist Gnostic, Arthur Rimbaud was it. Like, yeah. damn, like, you know, you read, you know, A Season in Hell is a Gnostic kind of text. It's yeah. Gnostic scripture of a certain kind. And when I read that, I feel the same thing. So Rimbos of Season in Hell is, 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 is a similar kind of text to me. So I, I, I think that if atheists want to write things off, they do it at their detriment. And I think that if, if religious people don't take their traditions in the fullness, right? In tradition, right? At least in Jew Judaism, the word Kabbalah means received. It's a word for tradition. Well, you've also received Hildegard of Bingen, Heidewig. I mean, my God. Like uh, the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan said, no one has understood desire aside from Heidegger. It's the only person in history that's understood it. Yeah. Desire has been completely misunderstood by every single other person than Heidegger. And I'm like, this is a guy who's a genius in psychoanalysis saying that the only person who understood this was a 14th century Christian mystical woman. Yeah. I take that real seriously. I take that very seriously, very seriously. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, the thanks for the the shout out to Rimbo, who I I I I consider personally, I, I put him into the, the the Gnostic camp for sure. So, and yeah. especially because you know the, the, we have so many ties to the the French occult revival, who also you know quite liked him. So I count him as one of ours. But I'm I'm just uh, spinning uh, uh, spinning rapping uh, on some of the minutia of your of your very important points. Uh, but I, I I completely agree. Um, okay, so. We're seeing now, and we've always seen it, right? All the, the occultists, esotericists, people interested in this stuff, they often go in hard and they do a lot of reading. They, they're very interested in it, right? Often, often. There's not a lot of uh, dilettantes. Um, 
but I think more than ever, we're seeing more of an intersection between um, the academy and uh, uh, occultists. So I, I'm wondering, a lot of occult traditions, they have traditional histories, sometimes secret histories, right. that, that don't seem to be literally true. Um, if we look at it with the info and scholarship that's open to us. Now, if these aren't literally true, should we get rid of these histories and these lineages and these, these stories about people discovering mysterious texts or meeting with a teacher that gave them a, a, a hidden underground lineage? Should we throw all that in the garbage? No, I don't think so. I, I, think that, I think that the task of myth is not to tell history. The task of, the task of, the task of myth is to generate meaning. And I think those are very different tasks. And one way you generate meaning is by telling stories. So when I look at the, the various myths, right? And I would use my own tradition as one of those myths, the Moses myth, right? I, I don't think there's any historical reason to believe that the Exodus ever happened, frankly. It just didn't, there's no reason to believe it happened historically. Um, so when I look at those stories, I'm asking myself, what am I, why am I reading this? And if you want to claim authority based only on those stories well what you're really interested in is power and you're interested in power regardless of the truth and frankly those kinds of people are not trustworthy right yeah they're just it's not trustworthy that those are those are, that, that, it, it, it's a kind of opportunism now myths are powerful not because they're historically true they're powerful because they interact with history in a meaningful way. And so I, I don't think that I'm interested in throwing myths away. I don't think that, and again, when I say myth here, I, I'm really using the, the, the old Greek idea of myth, muthos, right? The stories, the tales about the gods. I'm not using it in the sense of like, you know, leprechauns are a myth or something like that. Not that, again, and that's unfair to Irish people because <laughs> leprechauns are an important part of their mythology. Um, so no, I, I, again, I'm a both and guy. I, I think that we can tell myths and we can repeat myths and we can learn from myths, not because hist their historical verticality is the only register at which we should analyze them. That's ridiculous. We should measure them as, as indices of all kinds of things, historicality being one of those, and they may fall flat on that, but they also tell the stories about what kind of people we thought we were. How, what kind of people, like, again, for me, when I read the Exodus story, which I don't think is historically true, right, that the Jews were enslaved in Egypt, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt and, and escaped. I'm not interested, right, fundamentally in trying to argue that was really true because there's no archeological reason and there's no historical reason to believe it's true. What I am interested in is why did the people decide to make that their origin story, right? When we have superhero origin stories, which I think, again, superheroes uh, are really interesting kind of neo-esotericism, neo-mythology, um, we tell origin stories. We want to know why Wolverine became Wolverine. We want to know why Gambit became Gambit. We want to know why the Hulk became the Hulk. Well, the stories that they picked to describe the origin of those characters are meaningful because often there are real lessons to learn about suffering or isolation or alienation or, or bigotry when it comes to X-Men mutants and things like that. So that's, that's a really interesting kind of way of telling a story. Why did the Israelites decide, decide to tell themselves the story that they were slaves, the lowliest of lowly people? Most people, when they tell historical stories about who they were, they say how great we were and how everything was perfect and then things got messed up. Why begin a story with we were slaves? That's interesting. That's a weird story to tell. Why that story and how does that story continue to produce meaning now? So I think that throwing myths out and rejecting them because they lack historical verticality, I think is is um, reckless, reckless. I and also I think that uh, simply accepting tales right as historically accurate when we we don't have evidence for them is irresponsible. So I don't want to be irresponsible, but I also don't want to be. I don't want to live in a world where Everything aside from absolute positivism is meaningful. That seems that seems like a bizarre position that only positivistic things are basically meaningful. That's not tenable. That's not tenable, and it's not healthy. 
it's not healthy. So yeah. So I, I, again, I think it's it's for me. It's neither nor there. I don't want to be a positivist, right? And nor do I want to be a a person who's saying boo 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 Egyptian people now because they enslaved us. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and and very very harmful. I mean, uh, you can look at the history of how the the that the certain versions of that story have just been really toxic. And I never want to be in a room with an, a person from Egypt. And then and, and them hear me say things like, "Oh, your heritage is bad because you enslaved my people." Um, that's just not a. Pro it's it's not historically true, and it's detrimental to Jewish Egyptian relations now. Yeah. So, in my experience, um, you know, uh, esoterica is quite boundaried off. The occult is quite boundaried off. Though, you know, we're talking quite a bit about how how the, those boundaries are can be quite artificial, but. I, I'm wondering when I'm talking to occultists, um, you know, there can be so much, you know, if you're interested in something like the Golden Dawn, there's so much you can read just in that tradition. So I'm not blaming anyone, right? Like it's, it really takes a, a lot if you get really interested in an esoteric or mystical tradition to quote unquote master it. But I'm wondering if, if people are so in their traditions, they might be missing uh, 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 important insights from from great thinkers. So I'm wondering for those who who might consider themselves occultists, who might consider themselves esotericists and, and mystics, you know, the, what what who are some of the the thinkers that 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 they they should or could be reading to to illuminate their paths that, that they might that they may see as quote unquote outside of their tradition. Yeah, that's a great question. It's so it's so hard to to answer in a way that's well rounded. I guess the first thing, and this will sound weird, come from from the Jewish guy, is that um, Christianity gets really short shrift by occultists. Uh, Christ, Christian theology, Christian philosophy gets there, and I think this is a trauma response. Really, I don't think it's actually the result of people reading these Christian thinkers and then rejecting them. I think it's they reject Christianity because Christian institutions hurt them. Yeah. Um, and so, which is a completely legitimate thing. Obviously, I'm not ever saying that anyone should. And maintain a relationship with a tradition that's harmed them. That's not what I'm advocating. What I would say is that Christian theology and Christian philosophy doesn't get its appreciation. Uh, again, I'll go back to the example of, I don't know, Corn Cornelius Agrippa is a great example. Modern occultists rely almost exclusively on Cornelius Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy to frame their worldview, although I think no one basically follows his system, which is also weird to me that it's a system. You can't just like pick and choose what you like, but whatever. That's not, I'm not going to, everybody does it, I guess. But Agrippa was a Christian, like full stop. Like his main, like in the occult philosophy is not his main articulation of his beliefs. His main articulation of his belief is the day in Curtin where he basically says, you can't know anything except from having faith and, and God and, and Christ or whatever. So I think that one of the places where people could really deepen their relationship to the occult is ironically Christian philosophers, mm -hmm. because every ceremonial magician that wrote every single ceremonial text of magic was Christian, real Christian, because the magic only worked because of the truth of Christianity. So it's ironic. And again, this is a weird, again, from the outside, right? Because I'm, I'm, a, I'm just some Jewish guy, so I can see this stuff from the outside, I guess, assuming I'm seeing something, is that Christianity needed the occult. It needed a boogeyman. And like the Cathars, right? I think it needed the Cathars at some level, the Albigensians. But the occultists need Christianity. Their basic fundamental metaphysical structures rely on Christian toponyms, Christian metaphysics, uh, Platonism, stuff like that. Aristotelianism even. And so I think the ironic thing I would say is most occultists would benefit from reading Thomas Aquinas because Agrippa did. Agrippa's, Agrippa's three works of occult philosophy doesn't work without Thomas Aquinas. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. And if you actually go looking for how many times, uh, and, and again, the main work that Agrippa's uh, summarizing and, par and, and, and quoting often is Summa Contra Gentiles. Um, and there's no way that text even exists without Summa Contra, Contra, Summa Contra Gentiles. It just doesn't. 
It just doesn't. So now, again, I'm asking that people who've been harmed by a religion, institutional or otherwise, to embrace their abuser. No, absolutely not. I would never advise that. That's horrifying. But I think the Christian philosophers like Thomas Aquinas, like Duns Scotus, uh, like Meister Eckhart, um, these people are instrumental in the development of Western esotericism and not reading them, I think is a great detriment to occultists. Um, I'll also say that other, other, the, on the other side of that, there's also a tendency among occultists that I've noticed to pretend that philosophy basically ended in the 19th century. The great leaps and strides we've made, for instance, in logic, one of the things I advocate for, and one of the things that I think people, occultist people maybe think I'm crazy for, is that one of the things I argue is that mystics are among the most systematic thinkers in history. They're people who've had an experience that's overwhelmed them, and they work extremely hard at the intellectual level to make sense of it. And they bring to bear every intellectual tool they have to do that. And when I read, I mean, you read Again, Hildegard of Bingen, it's just so systematic. They're logical. They're systematic thinkers. They're rational, right? They're not just freewheeling, saying whatever comes to them. They're trying to make sense of it. And one of the tools I would say is logic, right? There's no reason to believe if you look at basically every major philosophical text on the occult, whether it's Proclus or Iamblichus, uh, whether it's, again, the tripartite tractate, um, you can't read the tripartite tract tractate or the or Apocryphon of John and not see the fact that there's a logical development from hypostasis to hypostasis. There's a reason why this hypothesis is underneath and gives rise to the next or generates the next. Plotinus, etc. Agrippa, G, whatever. Bruno also, uh, Junior Bruno. And so these people are deeply interested in logic. They're deeply interested in their ideas conforming to logic because they also believe that logic was part of reality. And so there's this, I think, a tendency to say, who cares about logic? Who cares about, you know, the truth? Everybody has their own truth. Uh, no one's truth is better than anyone else's truth. You might be right, and that might be what most people believe now. But show me a single Gnostic, show me a single occultist, show me a single hermeticist, Show me a single mystic in the Middle Ages that believes anything like, show me anyone who believed that in the Middle Ages, anybody. And I'll take the Pep's challenge on it. I don't think you're gonna find them. So I would say logic, logic, because for, for that reason, historically, the other reason is there are a lot of like sketchy people in the occult world, right? And I don't deal with them very much because I'm not in that world in that way, but there are sketchy predatory people and one of the things you're going to get out of logic is basic critical thinking, you know, and I've had I've had occult practitioners, uh, leaders of some kind of sketchy occult groups e actually email me, you know, they're really angry because their students are watching my channel or they're watching my channel and they're like, how dare you reveal the secrets of blah, 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 blah. I'm like, why are you watching my channel? This is like an undergraduate level channel. If you're a, a revealed adept who've communicated with archangels and you've learned the secrets of everything, why are you watching me? I'm just some guy. And secondly, if your students are watching me and asking you questions that undermine your authority, should you have it? Critical thinking is a hell of a drug. Like, um, and logic is a place to get that. Logic is a place to get that critical thinking. And logic isn't, doesn't mean that you're just always not believing everything. Skepticism is not about um, disbelieving in things. Skepticism is about withholding judgment until you get good evidence. And I, I encourage everybody, you know, I don't, again, again, when I say skepticism is about withholding assent, it's not about disbelieving in things. It's saying, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to ask more questions. And when I feel like I've gotten enough answers, then I'll assent to the fact that this guy really is an ascended master or whatever. So, exactly. yeah, so I, I would say that I think that most occultists would benefit from a deeper dose of Christian philosophy and theology. Mm -hmm. And I think that critical thinking and logic are bar none uh, essential tools for being a mystic 
at least you, if you, especially if you want to be a mystic in a historical sense, and also for diagnosing whether you're being manipulated by some jackass who's trying to extort you for money or sex. Yeah. Or both. Or both. So unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Maybe I can I can fit in one last question, which is the terms like occult, esoteric, even mystic, and even in very liberal denominations, in my personal experience, are there terms that can make people of faith very uncomfortable? So I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned earlier in the interview that you're married to a rabbi, yet, you know, you're publicly doing this channel, you're publicly engaging with these topics. Do you ever get any blowback for that? It's funny because my congregation is very, uh, very, very uh, rationalistic in a lot of ways. And I think that, so I never get blowback from that level. Um, I think that the main thing that I get, uh, I get blowback for, ironically, is that the, 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 the worry, right, is that I might be enabling people to believe irrational, dangerous things um, that they may, you know, uh, I've been in yeshivas, uh, Jewish institutions of higher learning, in the traditional world, where there are still people in that world that believe that the that the, the sun rotates around the earth. And a worry that I've heard is that I might be enabling people to persist in delusional or reactionary anti-scientific beliefs. And I, I don't think that's true. And I don't think that's true for a pretty simple reason. And that's pretty simple reason is I make it very clear that what I'm doing is I'm situating these texts and ideas in their historical context, and I'm trying to understand them without trying to justify any part of them. I don't have a dog in the fight. I just don't have a dog in the fight of whether, you know, John D. talked to angels. I just don't. And so that means that I can say that this is what we have. We need to evaluate it on its own terms and also bring to bear everything we know about history, religious studies, philosophy, whatever. And then at the end of the day, if I've done my job right, which I'm sure I, I, I do sometimes well and I do sometimes badly because every person's just a person and everyone is, you know, every person's a person. I think that what I want to do is I want to leave anyone who watches my channel or my content or hears a talk that I give, I want them to come away asking questions and, and coming down to the idea that on the one hand, this is worth studying, and on the other hand, we should ask a lot more questions before we believe whether or not the Greek magical papyri work, right? Or whether the Apocryphon of John accurately describes um, the structure of reality or whatever. So that's the big kickback I get, actually, is if I'm enabling um, delusional or, or other, uh, otherwise uh, anti-scientific beliefs. And I don't think so. I think that if a person's spirituality is anchored in the Western esoteric tradition, whatever that is, if it exists at all, I think that anyone who watches an episode of my channel or my show will come away asking questions about what they thought they believed. Um, and also, I think that a, a rigorous skeptic who watches an episode of the channel will also come away saying, oh, yeah, like, you just can't write alchemy off as pseudoscience. It's a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot more complicated than that. And so if I can get both sides of that to ask those questions, if I can get experienced practitioners to ask whether or not we should just believe in things, and if I can get skeptics to ask that just not believing in things ipso facto is a bad idea, if I can do both those tasks in a single episode of the of the channel, of the show, then I, I will have accomplished what I, you know, I will have accomplished a pretty Herculean task at some level. And if I if I accomplish that, I can feel pretty pretty proud about it. And at least in when I read the comments, people are on both sides, right? People on both sides. Mm -hmm. So, God willing, the show the the, the, the content's doing that. And um, again, you know, I've I've had Orthodox Christians, you know, who are uh, Gnostic curious, let's call them, right? Gnostic curious. You know, they've read about this guy Valentinus, and they knew that he had a big following, and so they're like, want to know what Valentinianism is, and they don't want to hear it from a Valentinian. Right, because they're they're you know they feel like they're being sold a line. So they find my episode on Valentinianism. And they're like, yeah, I don't believe that, but that's neat. That's interesting. That seems it. You know, I didn't know that. You know that, I didn't know that that, you know, the Trinity really doesn't just uh, pop out of Paul and, uh, you know, Orthodox Athanasianism had to be developed over time. And I'm like, yeah, it could have gone either way. It could have gone either way. 
history is a weird place. Yeah. Uh, history is a weird place. Well, Dr. Sledge, it's been simply incredible to have you on. Uh, I am sad that we have to wrap up, but it's, it's such as the world that we live in. Can you uh, remind people where they can find you online and engage with your work? Yeah, I think the if you want to if you want to check out my content, you can find me on on YouTube at Esoterica. I don't have any other social media. I'm scared of social media, um, but you can find me on YouTube at uh, at the Esoterica channel. So just go to YouTube and and type in Esoterica, and you'll you'll find me. Uh, if you have questions for me or if you want to interact with me, um, uh, feel free to reach me at my at my website, just justinsledge.com, which it's weird to be a .com, but we're all .coms these days. So yeah. you can find me there. And um, yeah, I look forward to uh, look forward to folks uh, finding me and hanging out. So, yeah. Fantastic. And quickly, my, my closing plugs are uh, holygrail.substack.com. Uh, that is, oh, that's actually the wrong link and wrong plug, but that's my parish in Montreal. We were being online <laughs> for the crisis, but we are no longer. But go there if you're in the Montreal area. What I meant to click for those watching is mylandmeditation.substack.com. I do uh, secular Sunday morning meditation at 11 a.m. Montreal time. That's Eastern time. Uh, we are taking a break for the summer, uh, but in the fall, we'll be back. Uh, we gather at a, at a local yoga, a yoga studio, and we broadcast the meditation from there. And we have, uh, it is interactive. You know, you can turn on your mic, you can ask questions, you can hang out, whatever. So we got a great crowd that comes out for that. And again, that's open secular, uh, psych psychology-based meditation meditation so it's great if you no matter what you believe or don't believe uh if you have a practice if you practice if you don't have a practice it, it's set up for uh any level of experience uh also if you go to twitch tv slash gnostic wisdom uh father tony who some of uh some of the regulars will know uh both the founder of the channel uh previous uh host and, and previous everything uh he is uh he's back he's doing stuff with us uh once again after a little hiatus and he's doing a lot of live streaming uh twitch tv slash gnostic wisdom he's trying to stream uh the f four nights a week with some some different projects so he's doing some hangouts some talking on different esoteric topics so you can ask questions and give out your wisdom he's also streaming gnostic themed video games uh on twitch and he is doing movie nights so we're finding esoteric and gnostic themed movies and we can watch them together as groups so go there and check out uh everything he's doing okay dr sledge thank you again so much good night everybody Thank you.